Hey there, I'm going to sneak in some audio real quick just to check audio for my other device. No, that's not what we like to hear. Fan mail from another planet. What was that? That gave me a massage in my head. USB connector connected. 9.58 a.m. Screen off. Thank you, Chad. Chair sound checked and ready to go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you're finding us on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. There, you can be the producer of the show by submitting the questions that we ask. Also, you can participate if you feel that um, you have some expertise that you'd like to contribute feel free to join our panel and our community as well. We are a 24 seven community on discord and um, helpful in sourcing questions on audio, video and production. So feel free to join in. Um, our second hour, usually we uh, focus on something in particular. Saturday's our education hour. So uh, Dave is going to take us through um, a continued uh, conversation around accessibility. So stick around for, for that, and we'll be able to submit your first hour and your second hour questions with the accessibility tag um, for the second hour questions that you'd like to ask. Dave, what do we have today? We're starting off with Vienna Tran in Adelaide, Australia. With reference to your AV work, what do you say to new people when they ask, what do you do? Go ahead, John. This is a really good one for me. I've always struggled with this because I always work for myself and I never know what to tell people. And I've changed it over the years. And now I just say I'm retired. I don't even tell them I do anything. So this is a tough one. The other thing is try to explain what office hours to people. That's another challenging one. Go ahead, Dave, have you had better success? Well, um, I used to just use, I work in computers. And that satisfied my mother, so that was good enough for most people. Um, I try and tell them that I facilitate other people's ability to communicate in, in whatever way they need, say training, education, uh, just uh, sales and marketing. So it can be any kind of assistance to people to help them communicate. But my work encompassed all different kinds of media, so I didn't just work in one field. I worked in print media and I worked in audio and video, and uh, I also worked in digital and interactive media. So um, it's extremely hard to explain what you're doing to make a laser disc and what it's for. Uh, it's a little easier when they say, when I say I'm a video producer, and then they just assume they know what I'm talking about. 
I often joke with this with my wife because uh, people say, uh, um, you know, I understand psychology because I have one and I understand TV because I watch one. So uh, it's a little harder, uh, but lately it's even harder, like, you know, like John has said, to explain what it is I'm up to for about three hours a day and uh, enjoy it so much, but nobody can figure out why. Guy Jeffrey? I'm a chief video producer to many major influencers. Courtney. I just tell them I'm an audio video engineer slash computer programmer slash retired. Yeah. Sad, but true. I'll have to say that uh, depending on who I'm talking to, um, if it's just in passing, I could say something related to audio and video work. But if I'm talking to someone that could in any way be a potential client, I prefer not to associate what I do with commodity services. Um, you start talking about putting people online, it's, well, how many hours or, you know, how large of a stream or how many participants can you have? What that results in is more of a commodities game where it's the lowest bidder, uh, common denominator, and people are going to be checking your prices versus others and just looking for the lowest price. And that's really not the type of client that I'm looking for. Um, really what I, uh, do is I love crafting uh, a story, you know, being able to tell someone's, someone's uh, what their communication is. Um, I will offer to be a partner with people to be able to tell their story, or the other uh, focus is on engagement. How is it that we can get the best engagement out of your audience to be able to have, let them have an experience where, uh, where they're able to remember this type of experience. So that's what I generally tend to, to focus around, uh, something around those, uh, those ideas. I find that um, when I focus on those type of things as opposed to commodities, um, I, I'm working with a client that is not constantly checking their bottom line all the time. Uh, it's, it's much more pleasant and um, you know, you're not in that uh, commodities market. Let's go to our next question. Our next one comes from Australia as well. Brian Shan in Sydney. I guess everyone's up early in Australia today. Uh, suggestions for a good quality field bag that doesn't look like a camera bag. We'll be carrying a DSLR jacket and some food. Any suggestions okay. for him? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, I was trying to research this. I don't do much traveling, but I found one uh, that is fairly highly rated. It's called, uh, it's from uh, Wandered. W-A-N-D-R-D, -D, and it's the Priv Key. I don't know how to pronounce that, if that's correctly. They make it in three different sizes. It doesn't it's a backpack. It doesn't necessarily look like a camera bag, uh, and it comes in three different sizes. It looks pretty nice. A couple of hundred bucks. It does have inserts for cameras. Uh, uh, another, if that's too expensive for the 200 I like these. Uh, I've used a lot of these Amazon Basics bags. They're really well made. They're uh, ripstop uh, canvas. And uh, here's one that's made out for DSLRs, but it kind of looks like a camera bag. Uh, another possible solution, if you don't want to uh, attract attention to it, if you're going to be traveling, is get that bag and uh, put it inside of uh, one of these. And a Dora the Explorer little rolling backpack, and no one will be the wiser. You can drag your camera all over, and no one will want to grab that and run with it. Well, I, I get the uh, subterfuge, Courtney, but if you go too far down the other spectrum, then it's just like, why is this guy carrying Dora to explore a backpack? Around? Well, you have to rent a small child. I forgot to mention that. Rent a small <laughs> child to go with that. And, it and comes go. with courier. Copy. Yeah. Go ahead, union, Dave. Uh, union people, too. Um, uh, he reminded me that, uh, yes, having a bag that's on nondescript and everything else doesn't draw attention. And as well, uh, you want to have places where your bag is protected. So uh, I use bags that are clearly labeled. They're production bags and they're they're by brand people and they're the blue color and all the rest. So yeah, I'm a heavy target for that. But I also make sure that, uh, you know, I don't put my lunch in there because it's going to mix with the other stuff. Next question. Jeffrey Powers from Madison, Wisconsin. NDI is planning a virtual event on April 11th. Thoughts on what it could be? He's got a link. Jeffrey? I wasn't planning on throwing this ball to myself, but I'll take it. Uh, so, of course, uh, 
NAB is happening the week uh, after. So I'm really hoping that uh, NDI is going to come out with NDI 6. I'm really hoping that they're going to start thinking about actually doing an audio only NDI. So you could actually use that for uh, similar to Dante and compete in that area. But we'll see what happens. Go ahead, John. I just got an email. It's uh, NDI green swag. That's what it is. Go ahead, Dave. Maybe Jeffrey can help me here because I don't understand NDI. Um, I understand it's a network interface and it uh, handles video and audio, but I don't know about these versions. What What is the difference between these things and what improvements does each subsequent version uh, give us? Well, right now we're on NDI 5.5. And uh, it's it's just been getting better ever since uh, this. Uh, you know, we have we have companies that basically do all their production via NDI. They've uh, they've pretty much ditched a lot of their physical cabling, uh, and uh, they run it pretty successfully. Um, and so uh, right now with NDI five point five, you can uh, you can set up. A, I have my studio mostly on NDI. Uh, you can set up any studio with that. Uh, you can set it up to remote from anywhere. Uh, you can set it up to send it to an AWS instance. You can uh, you can monitor different. You don't even need to use it as a as a video uh, for things like Zoom or anything like that. A couple of days ago, uh, somebody asked about doing a um, a office to office video conference, oh, and yeah. one thing that they can do with yeah. that is the NDI camera and NDI studio monitor back and forth and be able to uh, be able to see what's going on on the other side. So it it's just there is a lot of great items that you, and oh yeah, you can also uh, turn it into a KVM. So if you wanted to okay. if you need to control a, a desktop, you can do it from there. So there's a lot of great functionality and I'm I'm really hoping that they're going to expand on the audio, but of course uh, NDI 6.0 is probably what uh, what I'm really expecting. So is there a box interface that I would need before I do cabling and all the rest that NDI has an in, in and out kind of concept? Well, the NDI tools will let you uh, take care of your Mac or our Windows PC because uh, right. it'll, it'll give you options. But uh, right now I'm looking at a camera, the PTZ Optics camera, which does have NDI in it. And so that's sending it to my computer to vMix, which is then uh, decoding it so it can go out to Zoom. So okay. that's the uh, that's my workflow right now. So when more devices start supporting NDI or providing NDI access, it bypasses. Um, it goes more direct to your computer. Then, what do you mean by bypasses? I'm not sure. Uh, well, I'm looking at analog. Uh, I've got a camera here and a microphone and mixer. Um, these are all analog, so they go into my computer through translation to USB. If I were okay. to go to NDI, would that make it easier? I would just have one USB and then everything comes to me through NDI? Uh, it would make it easier for the computer because the computer is not dealing with the USB bus. But in another aspect, your your network has to be pretty solid. And the, the one thing about NDI is it is, I, I always like to say, it's like, it's like shooting a, 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 a shotgun. Everything just goes everywhere, and whatever catches will will catch it. So, you, uh, like right for uh, for instance, I could have a, com a couple computers running behind me with the same video shot, and I could be maybe recording to those as as individual ISOs, while this one does all the streaming and switching. So mm -hmm. it's a it's it's it. If you're looking for something with security to it, NDI might not be the best option, but for something like what I do. It, there's a lot of great options and abilities that NDI has. And that's the thing, I guess, I was cautious about myself because I'm not a network kind of guy. I don't, I've never managed a network and I've never had to set IPs or all that kind of stuff. And I've heard people on Office Hours talk about their issues with managing the network side of NDI. So I just figure you're giving me some pretty good ideas of how it works. Yeah, that's and why people build up an NDI server so they can kind of corral where the signals go uh, back and forth. Okay. And one of the other things that uh, Jeffrey sort of alluded to is that um, you can also have PTZ control right from the um, 
right from that uh, network, that uh, software suite that uh, new tech delivers with that. So some companies are making cameras that are NDI compatible in which um, you just plug them into a network port and then arrange it from there and then be able to run your uh, services right from, from that service. Um, and we got a message. Uh, also, we had a chat message uh, from Guy Cochran that he tells us that the announcement will be spinning off their own business uh, from a protocol to a technology company so that competitor manufacturers will be able to adopt it without f fear of this being proprietary, which is oh, very interesting. Thing. Yeah, stabilizing yeah, because, the, um, the platform, yeah. Well, it, it, it's, you know, competition of standards uh, is something that um, uh, companies will compete on you know, as far as using one thing or another. So if, if new tech is uh, successful and being able to to spin this off is just allowing people to to adopt their standard and built it in, we could see a, a enlarged uh, ecosystem of devices uh, that are compatible with the services. You plug them in and you're able to use them in your network services. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Does that require licensing it from new tech or is it uh, if they're going to have it as a uh... A separate uh, uh, technology standard rather than a uh, a product, a specific product. Would you license the NDA protocol from them so they'd still get paid, but you won't be necessarily competing with them for the product itself? I actually don't know that. I know that some devices you did have to buy a um, a new tech license for it to it, to enable them. Um, Jeffrey, maybe Jeffrey knows. Actually, Courtney, you are absolutely correct. Uh, for NDI to come into like the PTZ optics, they do have to pay a license fee. Um, so th the real question now is what's going to happen to the NDI tools? Are they going to remain free for the regular user or are they going to start going to, into a, maybe a subscription model or anything like that? Because that could really change the game and how like I use NDI uh, and how some big uh, production uh, areas do. But yeah, if you build hardware, you're going to have, if you want to have NDI on it, you could have a license or you could also say it's NDI compatible and then make the person that purchases the camera by the individual license. And uh, Steve Yuroff also mentions in our chat, um, a good point. NDI ca cameras are ethernet devices and your computer can gain NDI uh, abilities via software. I would add too that some uh, firmwares have been updated to uh, enable this uh, functionality. Go ahead, Nigel. Yeah, I wonder whether um, Dante is causing them some pain and whether, uh, sorry, someone's calling me on the phone. I need to drop that. Um, I wonder whether Dante is calling them, causing them some problem and they're trying to find a way to uh, muscle their way into that space. Yeah, it's a interesting world. We'll see how they're able well, to spin that. That is a mystery to me as well. So I'll I'll take that up on the next <laughs> next round. Have somebody explain Dante to me. I've I've heard that's a a, a readoption of an existing platform. So, yeah. Go ahead, John. I think they're more worried about twenty one ten than they are Dante. My guess. Yeah, it's might be the uh, VHS beta wars all over again where it's the adoption of a standard you know um who gets their their foot in the door first i think that um ndi has had their uh has been on the ball and running for quite a while so uh, we'll see how much they're looking back all right that was an interesting discussion that is apropos to our uh media and production uh keep in mind um Producers, I'm speaking to you uh, watching the show. You can produce the show by directing us, by asking questions in Mukana. Go to officehours.global to be able to to, uh, to put in your questions. And let's see what we have next. Uh, Dave? Brian Shan comes back to us from Sydney, Australia. What grade of diffusion cloth would be suitable for a home studio Zoom lighting? Go ahead, Dave. I just brought it out of the cupboard here, but uh, I use this stuff and I buy it from a lighting service. Various grades of diffusion can be bought, some uh, more thin than others. This one's one of the thin ones. And uh, I'm a lighting guy from way back, so I, I have a contact and we I buy directly and I buy in large quantities. But some of the other suggestions I would make is, uh, you know that 
stuff that's on a sheer part of a drape when a fancy house has sort of light drape and then the heavy drape for darkening the room. That sheer is uh, pretty good at diffusing. It's a little thin, but it would depend, of course, if you're putting a sharp light behind it or a thin light, uh, a, a, a wider light. So it's recommended, of course, to use uh, lighting panels these days, and they diffuse in that sense of being a large uh, source. Uh, and a thin piece of that would probably help you in spreading the light around a little more. Um, a muslin cloth, which is used for you know constructing sets and, and backdrops and stuff, is also quite transparent. And uh, depending on the density of the muslin, uh, you can get a, a pretty good diffusion out of that. Um, bed sheets are often a little too thick. So you're going to drop your light by about half if you try and put a bed sheet in front of it. Unless, of course, it's a well-worn bed sheet and it's very thin and you can do that. So um, lighting diffusion from a supplier is, is what I would recommend because you've got the most control. You can do, you can stage it in its thicknesses and they'll give you a, a range of thickness. So it depends on how sharp your light is. I only have one uh, spotlight in my kit and that's why I have diffusion. And often when I mount my diffusion, uh, my spotlight is just very small. It's about a four inch uh, diameter and my uh, coverage is about two feet square. Uh, so I try and get about a foot and a half by a foot and a half on a frame in front of it. And that gives me great diffusion. Uh, but right now I'm using uh, large lights uh, and LEDs and they give me diffusion already. So the uh, screens that can go on the front of them or the uh, softness of uh, the fabric that's on them is giving me diffusion. Okay, yeah, Courtney. Yeah, Dave covered most of it there really well. Uh, here in Hollywood, we use uh, Roscoe gel which is a gel type diffusion. This is a 216 is a standard diffusion type, and this is half 216. You can get it, it comes in sheets. It's kind of pricey. These gels were originally designed for use in front of tungsten lights, which were kind of hot. You didn't say what kind of lights you're going to be using in front of. This is uh, this won't melt in front of a hot light, but you could hang up a sheet in front of an un unfiltered light, uh, you know, light bulbs of any kind, LED bulbs, etc., and uh, get some diffusion. If you want to do it on the cheap or a DIY, check out your Bed Bath & Beyond for some uh, a shower, uh, a frosted shower curtain, just clear vinyl. Uh, not clear vinyl, but frosted vinyl shower curtain. That's what we used to use before we used the Roscoe 216 uh, in front of a light. Uh, that makes a good diffuser and usually doesn't add too much color into it. Make sure you get one that's uh, not colored. But as Dave said, these days with LED lights being all the, uh, you know, popular, the popularity of them, I just got, get some of these. These are, you know, by the time you pay for your Roscoe gel, you can afford a, a pair of these 13-inch uh, diffuse panel lights that come with their own stands and carrying case. Uh, and those give you a nice square light that looks, if you're wearing glasses, it looks like a window or something reflected in your glasses. It doesn't look like studio lighting. And those also have the advantage of being bicolor. They can be set to tungsten or daylight or anything in between by turning a knob, and they're dimmable as well. So that's right. I'd go with that rather than go with your existing studio lighting and try and gel it. Right, and and color correction used to be the deal with Roscoe gel. Is is you would convert for daylight or tungsten and match lighting that was all in the environment already. And the uh, diffusion stuff was a secondary consideration. But yeah, this uh, we're also talking about fairly expensive stuff too. I failed to mention that this stuff here uh, costs a bit of money. So, so shower sheet, it might be. Um, I will just add that um, if you tend to um, pick something that is um, thinner, you can always double it up. Uh, to get the appropriate uh, diffusion. And I do agree with the consensus that, uh, you know, aiming for those panel lights would would greatly simplify things. Unless, of course, uh, you're trying to diffuse natural lighting. Uh, in that case, yeah, the, the larger diffusion could be helpful. And being able to double or triple it uh, to whatever length you need uh, could be helpful in dialing that in. Let's go to our next question. It comes from Alex Lindsay in Novato, California, USA. I just received my Melee Quieter 3Q. How should I use it in office hours? Go ahead, Sam. Well, uh, Courtney should be answering this since he's the one that's the 
the melee uh, expert, but I would uh, suggest using the big focus companion a server for it. Uh, and also I would be very interested in the uh, running OBS or remix on it. Of course, it won't be powerful to do uh, powerful streams, but maybe as a screen share PC. All right. Well, Courtney's going to f- gonna follow up. Uh, these make great uh, video players play out. Um, uh, you can stick a, you know, uh, as, as a media server, you can stick a four terabyte uh, SSD inside of them. They're fairly tiny. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, oh, this one's gotten rather expensive. It has uh, the 5105 and 16 gigabytes. I don't know which version you got. The eight gigabytes are a lot cheaper. Uh, they have gone up on their prices. Ooh, wow. Uh, but um, uh, it can be used for uh, video playback. I use them for playing back uh, multiple videos at the same time. They have two HDMI outputs, so you can uh, feed two screens with them, and you can add a pluggable uh, screen expander You know, to add a couple of more screens to it. Uh, and they work, uh, they're great for also uh, recording stuff for recording studios because they have no fan whatsoever. They're completely silent. You can put them in the booth with you uh, to control, and uh, it's a full Windows PC. So any any software, recording software that runs on in Windows will run on it, and it makes it great for that, uh, as well as uh, to play back stuff. If you have to have stuff that's uh, software that is browser-based, it's good for that too to put in there with you. So I'm imagining then, Courtney, that the uh, the draw of these devices is that they um, their price point, their software compatibility on Windows, uh, and maybe even their size. If the um, these prices tend to creep up, when is the uh, cutoff point? Do you think when you start to look for maybe something in a smaller PC format? I know that the Pies have pretty much priced themselves out. Yeah, the. Um... I think uh, once you get up to three hundred dollars, you know you can get the um, uh, the B links come in fairly powerful packages. You can get you know uh, uh, those with the ri- um, Ryzen processors in them, and you can get them with uh, i fives uh, and i sevens in them. Uh, you know, quad core uh, eight eight thread units, um, but they're a bit thicker and bigger. These. These ones from Melee are, are fanless and smaller, but they have, tend to have the Celeron processors in them. So, the uh, and the 5105 has a better um, a better graphics uh, a GPU in it <clears throat> from uh, Intel. So, uh, it can handle more channels of playback and encode. They also have encode and decode of H.264 and H.265. So, it makes good streaming uh, streaming server if you want to put a bunch of uh, apps for. Uh, you know, YouTube TV or uh, any of the streaming services, Netflix, et cetera, they work really well on there and can stream 4K. They, both of those HDMI outputs can handle 4K60. Uh, so that should be no problem. And I've run endurance on them. Um, I've run playing back, let's see, I was playing back 18 high-def video uh, streams looping for a couple of days, and it never throttled down, so it it was able to handle all that without uh, without overheating. Have you um, gotten a chance to test them, Courtney, to see if they are capable of joining a Zoom joining as a Zoom client and presenting 1080p? I know that um, Zoom well, that's does a have Zoom limitation. Problems. I don't know if Zoom has changed that, and I don't know whether that's a limit. To, and if you're using Zoom OSC like we are, I'm not sure that's a limitation either. I think it was a limitation in the in the web software for Zoom. It checked just to see, you know, it checked your manifest or checked the data to see if you had more than four cores, then it would let you go to 1080p. If you had four cores or four threads or less, it would not let you, it would keep you at 720p. But uh, most Zoom calls are at 720p anyway, maximum, except for us special people. (laughs) Yeah, I, I don't have the spec up in front of me right now, but I knew that um, it also had to do with uh, CPU utilization, so whatever else you may be having. And if you check that checkbox in Zoom to use uh, GPU acceleration, it'll use the it should use the H.264 encoders that are built into the GPU in this unit. Um, so, you know, there's encode and decode. I don't know, there's 21 pa- 24 paths, I think, of decode in there. 
So it, it does pretty good on that stuff if the software is designed to use it. Zoom may be limiting it because they just don't want to deal with all the different, in the Windows world, all the different types of GPUs there are and how to support them all in hardware. Uh, they'd rather just use the CPU to decode. Yeah. Um, and go ahead, John. Go ahead, John. This is a perfect computer to put inside of a very large rocket with an X3 360-degree camera. Yeah, absolutely. I will say right. uh, they run off 12 volts DC too. That's the other nice thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there was some uh, talk in the chat about PoE uh, powering. I don't believe um, that these ones are. Is that is that correct? Okay, I didn't think so. It, about no, the, they do. Um, uh, some of them have a USB C for power, and some of them have just a coaxial barrel uh, 12 volt power. Um, I think this one, the newer ones have a uh, USB C for power there, right next to the Ethernet port. But I don't think they take uh, power over Ethernet to power them. I think that might be a vestige from our conversation of uh, taking the converting the power from Ethernet to be able to to supply a thing. I will say though that uh, on the Zoom uh, specs for 1080p, I did have a um, Surface uh, device that did qualify for the 1080p. It qualified, but it didn't work out too good. Even for those um, low voltage processors, I just had a tough time uh, playing back uh, when tasked with 1080p. It seems to be quite a bit of an uptick from 720 to 1080p. And some would argue that there is a minimal um, difference in upgrade. There's definitely a large upgrade between 360p and 720 but the modest uh, upgrade in 720p to 1080p, I think, uh, brings with it quite a bit of uh, a lift along with that improvement. Go ahead, Jeffrey. I'm going to talk a second about the PoE action. You're not going to ever see a PoE in a uh, PC or a Mac, for that matter, because the biggest problem with, uh, with any type of machine is it fluctuates in power. Uh, it can go from... 2 volts to 12 volts to uh, to more if you've got more stuff plugged into it, and that just overloads a PoE system. The only way I could see that actually uh, happening where Ethernet could be PoE is if there's an internal battery inside the machine, and it, and it has at least 30 to 50 percent pow uh, power to that battery, then a PoE can safely uh, continually charge the battery as the battery is uh, is taxing on you know different types of voltages. But that would take a lot of extra stuff in there. And, and of course, that melee would not be that small. I want to say that uh, when we had uh, Chris Sabato on for his one man show, um, he had this little device at the end of his PoEs that could get 12 volt output to power a thing. I'm trying to remember what the current draw of what he was using, but pretty uh, pretty slick alternatives. I don't think it was something with much draw though. But uh, anyway, uh, let's go to our next question. Our next one's from Douglas Carmichael. In this live performance video, and he provides a link, the keyboard player is using Filmic Pro on an iPad to monitor a video source on another device. Has anyone done that with Filmic? How accurate is monitoring over Wi-Fi? Yeah, Jeffrey. So I looked at that a little bit more. Uh, basically, that's uh, keyboardist Darren Mullen. He's got his own studio, which is really interesting. And what I'm going to do is I'm, I got the uh, I got the the link here. Uh, there's another video on a different channel that ex he basically explains everything that he's doing with that. So uh, he started this uh, channel that, that uh, tries to make accurate accurate uh, songs, cover songs, which is really cool. And uh, of course, he's bringing a whole bunch of cameras in. The front camera is an iPhone in that video. And uh, that's how he's doing that. He's just monitoring what's going on. If you look at the video itself, the frame rate is just uh, is is uh, atrocious. Now uh, I've used a lot of you know we're talking about NDI. I've used a lot of over the Ethernet type uh, video to solve that. And like for instance, I'm using NDI. Uh, this is a Top Director by uh, which is an NDI program where I'm actually can see all of my cameras that are running in right now uh, right on my iPad and the latency on that really depends on how much is running through the network. 
and how you have your network set up. So uh, from all the videos that I've seen him do that, the really the only camera that he's monitoring is that front camera. All the other cameras are just basically GoPros or little action cameras like that that are recording. And then he's taking all the video and putting it in DaVinci Resolve to, uh, to do post editing. Next question. Next question comes from Alex Lindsay in Novato, California. Has anyone else seen their YouTube homepage fill with very short videos? Nigel? I guess we're talking about YouTube shorts here. And I've actually rather enjoyed YouTube shorts. Um, I, my page is mostly things that I like to watch. So I try and moderate it very well. But I've discovered that sometimes if I can get Wi-Fi on an airplane and I'm stuck about 100 yards from the gate because uh, there's another plane there, YouTube shorts can fill up a 15 or 20 minute time very much, very good. Although for some reason, Dr. Pimple Popper is very frequently in my uh, in my stream. So I don't know what that says about me. And I wonder those around me watching me, what conclusion they draw from that. Jeffrey? You must have watched Stephen Haywood's uh, episode of, of that uh, show uh, where... He had his some stuff done to his nose. Uh, he works at PTZ Optics, by the way. Anyway, uh, so what people have been doing, this is actually pretty interesting. Uh, you, if, when you create a short, it needs to be one minute. If you go, if you even hit that one minute mark, it's considered a regular YouTube video. Anything under one minute is considered a YouTube short. Now, what some people are doing, uh, they're trying to cross the streams, so to speak. So what they'll do is they'll create a 59 second, 59.56 second short, and then they'll create a 1.1, 1, uh, one minute, one second short. And that one minute, one second short is probably what you're seeing. Maybe not, but probably what you're seeing. Uh, and uh, and so they're they're testing the waters and seeing if they double that out what their numbers are going to be. The other thing is if you do that wrong, if you're uh, if you do the short wrong, then uh, it actually shows up as a regular YouTube video. And so you have to re-upload it and try to make it as a short. I thought you, I remember you talking, Jeffrey, about um, some other aspect ratios for shorts. Um, that is, is it correct, anything, yeah. anything below that 60 seconds will still play as a short regardless of aspect? Yeah, the, 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 it's not about the aspect. Uh, well, if you're doing uh, 9 by 16 that or 16 by 9, then uh, then that's that's one thing. But if you're doing 9 by 16, if you're doing anything 4 by 3, 3 by 4, uh, there's a couple other resol uh, resolutions in there. I've been playing with a lot of uh, square video to try and, and see how that works. Because the best part about that is when you watch it on the phone, you just have the, uh, you have the border on the top and the bottom. But if you're watching it on a TV, all of a sudden you have a whole bunch of new real estate that you can deal with. And I've been watching some, pr some pretty cool uh, Star Trek recap videos where they've been, uh, they've been really utilizing that uh, square screen for the TV use. Go ahead, Dave. Well, this discussion reminds me of a phrase that Dennis Hopper made back in about 1978. He declared that in the future, all movies will be seven minutes long. And I think we're going to get there. He wasn't ambitious enough. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, this kind of drives me nuts because a lot of times YouTube will put it up in the advertising panel, you know, and it'll show you and you'll, you'll think, you know, think, oh, look, here's a good tutorial on how to do X. And I'll click on it and it'll get, you know, one minute in and it'll stop. And I go, well, you know. A lot of people, what they do is they'll take their long, long form videos and they'll make an excerpt clip that's less than one minute and stick it up on YouTube Shorts uh, to entice you to find the longer version. So you just start to get into it and then it ends. And then if I'm watching on my TV, I don't have the links appearing there on screen to click on to take you to the longer one. So I don't know where to go then to find that longer one. And so I'm kind of lost. So that's what I don't like about it when it shows up in my uh, YouTube player on TV. I have to say it has been effective for me. I think they're kind of leveraging the idea around like you're swiping through videos, which works fine if you're actively there and like, oh, okay, I'll watch another one. Swipe, swipe, swipe. What doesn't quite work so well is I, I've i long passed the threshold of being on YouTube Premium for the amount I watch and how much of my life that advertisements would take. Um, so I... I basically live on YouTube for all, all sorts of different things. 
And if if I'm watching shorts, I will tend to you know put my because you can do some things on the phone uh, on premium that you can't do uh, otherwise. You can turn the screen off. You can uh, download them, watch them later. Um, I'll have them flip through the shorts and if I'm doing something or whatever and have it playing, it'll just repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. And, um, I almost wish there's like a, uh, auto, <laughs> just go to the next one <laughs> button because after a while, if I'm getting involved in something and I'll hear it over Bluetooth or thing, and it's just going over and over again, it, it almost feels like a type of torture. Uh, if you're, if you're not careful, if I was incapacitated and wasn't able to get to the next video, it might be the end of me. Anyway, let's go to our next question. Our next question is from Douglas Carmichael. The U, the new Yamaha DM3 mixer does not support per channel direct outs with a variable pickoff point, nor channel inserts other than a built-in gate compressor. Wouldn't that be an impediment to many workflows? Could we see that change in an update? Go ahead, Dave. Well, I'll jump in first that the Yamaha is a, a low cost. It's, it's expensive to the ordinary person, but it's a low cost mixer. So in that sense, there's always a trade-off. Uh, I come from the days when Tascam was just making inroads. And when you used a Tascam mixer, you were expecting it to do certain things, but you didn't expect it to be a full desk. And so you didn't have, and you had to compromise. Well, I won't have this, so I'll have to do it this way. And I think you're expecting a little bit more from that DM3. Uh, it does come with a complement of 12 mono inputs and uh, four that are uh, an additional four that allow for uh, quarter uh, quarter inch jacks. And so there's a lot of inputs to this thing. And then there's the six mono outputs in the stereo. So there are ins and outs, and there are a way to, to channel those things through the touchpad. Uh, I don't know if you want to have as many of those things in whatever it is you're doing, unless you're you know, doing a 16-piece band or something. Uh, then you'd have to worry about foldback and, and inserts and that sort of stuff. So uh, I guess, it, as Mickey likes to start with, it depends on what you're going to apply it to and then see if it serves your needs. Uh, as a digital mixer, yeah, it's it's a high quality mixer and, and it's gonna work for what it was intended to do. But even on the page, it says for you know small venues, for uh, corporate work and for streaming, there's plenty of capacity in that thing. I don't think you're gonna do sophisticated musical tricks with a Yamaha DM3 uh, that you would for say a full studio desk in a, in a recording studio because nobody's going to really demand that from you. But if your client is demanding that, then I would rent a mixer that is going to have these features and then make that my workflow. Samuel? Yeah, well, I completely agree with uh, Dave uh, about the, the price point and the, the features. I've used the TF1 quite a bit. Uh, for mixing and it uh, the interface looks very similar. You can route the the, the outputs to the omni outs, but there's not uh, you can uh, route the the effects uh, to a certain yeah. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, I totally agree. If I was doing live street, uh, if I was doing a live concert, I would not care really for that in in what I would do. But uh, it also it says that it has Dante in it. So if it's got Dante, does does it Dante end up taking care of the direct outs because that's what I would do, I would use it for. So if I would need it, then I'd just have to get uh, Dante certified. I'll tell you what, uh, I am going to NAM next week. I will be there on uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And I am definitely stopping at the Yamaha booth, and I will take a look at this DM3 if they have it available in booth. Fantastic. Let's go to our next question. Our next question is from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas, USA. Many old iMac 27-inch, etc. are doorstops. Well, that's a judgment. Can they be turned into a Windows 11 machine, or will they choke on Windows? If not, what would be the most productive Linux or other OS you could install on old iMacs? Courtney? Well, if it's an Intel-based uh iMac, uh, which the older are, you can install using uh, Boot Camp Assistant. You can install Windows 10 on there. I wouldn't install Windows 11, but Windows 10 would be a good choice. Uh, the only problem is 
Apple wrote the video drivers, which they always, Apple has always written video drivers to run Windows to be uh, um, hampered to not run well on, <laughs> to force you to run on the Mac operating system. So uh, the dri the video drivers may not be very good. You may not have access to the uh, uh, hardware GPU to accelerate stuff. So games and things may not run very well under boot camp, but you have to give it a shot. Maybe someone has, has bit the bullet and, and made some better graphics drivers for Windows 10 to run on the Apple hardware. But there's lots of videos online on how to install Windows 10 uh, using uh, Boot Camp Assistant onto the older iMac. So give it a shot. Bit, Linux, eh, you might be able to do it. I haven't tried. I will say, Courtney, it, um, I've not really dabbled into the Windows 11 um, upgrades on any of the devices that have offered it to me. Um, is better performance on um, system stats a feature of Windows 11, or is it just basically the compatibility that you would steer towards 10? It's, um, Windows 11 is mostly cosmetic improvements, changes in the user interface a little bit that makes it just more confusing. I haven't found it, uh, Windows 11, to run much faster at all than uh, than Windows 10. They seem pretty much the same to me. Gotcha. Go ahead, Dave. Well, talking of old Macs, um, in 2009, I was running a very old um, i9 Mac, and I ran both Linux and Windows on it using Parallels, so I could switch between them quite easily. Uh, they performed really well. I mean, Windows was snappy enough for me, and it worked really well on the networks that I was connected to. So being that it was a laptop, of course, it's a bit like the iMac in that it has its own display. Uh, dealing with all of the apps and everything in Windows, there wasn't any tricks or things or patches that I needed or drivers I needed to install because Apple kind of carried that and Parallels did too. They kept all the drivers up to date for um, virtual hard drives and that sort of thing. Um, also, I was able to run Linux on an i5 uh, uh, version, uh, uh, the chip, uh, the Intel chip for Mac. Um, I wouldn't recommend running Windows in an i5, but Linux will run on that. It's a very lightweight uh, thing. Of course, depending on the flavor of Linux you want to pick from. But uh, I think if, you're, if your iMac, your old iMac is an i7 or an i9, you're going to be able to run Windows on that thing just fine. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, and it's also going to depend on the age of your iMac. Uh, if you've got something, if even an i7, I got the 2012 MacBook Pro right behind me. That is an i7, uh, and I think it it's one step before Sandy Bridge. So there's certain things that I cannot do with that. Uh, but it it putting on Linux easy to do. It's just a real question of what you're going to be doing with the machine. If you're going to turn it into a media server, if you're going to turn it into a, something that's backing up your uh, your files, if you're going to you know like a time machine uh, or anything like that. That's where that's where you're going to start to ask of course the the questions for the right version of Linux. Now, there is one other thing, and that is the Hackintosh community has been looking at older MacBooks and Mac devices in loading newer versions of, of, uh, of Mac software onto the older devices. Because well, as Dave said, you know, some of these i7, i9 Intel versions of Mac are still very useful. And as far, I have my 2017 right here, and I am on the beta program, uh, and I am on Ventura 13.4 on that. So Apple is still making new versions of the Intel software, at least for the next year or two. Uh, so they're trying to make sure that all Macs are included as best as possible. So take a look at Hackintosh and see what, uh, what they're doing. All right, let's go to our next question. Our next one is from James Haldane in Vancouver, Canada. What LED fixtures would be a good replacement for Airy 300 watt plus tungsten Fresnels? And I did check out your uh, Fresnel uh, lens, uh, Ari, there. Um, probably depend on some features as far as what you, um, what you want to replace it with. I'm assuming you want to keep all the same specs, have the uh, have the Fresnel lens. Other factors are, do you want to battery power it? Is size um, a consideration? Um, how about noise? 
Is it something that you just want raw power and aren't concerned about fan noise? Uh, go ahead, Courtney. And I work with a lot of guys. I don't own any of these that use these aperture lights. They really like them. These like this uh, C three hundred. It's kind of pricey, um, but it does have a. Uh, it, it's a cob based LED, and it does have a Fresnel attachment for another hundred and nineteen bucks. You can put on it if you want that Fresnel lens on the front to give you a better spread. Uh, it's possible. I'm seeing a lot of those. Most most uh, the corporate and mid level lighting have, have switched over to these apertures. Thanks, Courtney. So check that out. James, let's go to our next question. Our next one is from Todd Weiser in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Has anyone used a stream deck to control a video camera setting during a live event, a camera setting? If so, what kit was used? Can you help us out, Samuel? Yeah, well, I used uh, the PTZ cameras with BitFocus Companion over the Sony Visca protocol. And uh, I was able to set down the speed uh, to very slow speed and then pan slowly across the room. And then it cut to another another shot automatically with just one press of a button. Uh, I've also uh, played a little bit with, it's not directly controlling the camera, but the APCR Mini from Middle Things controls the uh, gimbal. So you can do uh, gimbal movements uh, with the with the uh, uh, controlled with BitFocus Companion. Uh, so there are also a couple of other options you can look at if you really want to control uh, cameras with a Stream Deck. Canon has uh, quite a few options for some of their cameras, and also almost all PTZ cameras will integrate with BitFocus Companion. Yeah, that's right. They, um, have you been looking at the newest uh, beta version, uh, Samuel, or are you still with the uh, the tried and true? On my computer here, I'm running the 3.0. Uh, but when I'm doing production in a place, then I use the, the old 2.0 version. All right, understandable. Go ahead, Jeffrey. So uh, you got to remember that the commands actually come from the camera. So if the hardware doesn't allow you to do it, you won't be able to do it. With that said, I use the PTZ optics cameras and I've been building a, it's actually pretty interesting. The idea is I, I, I'm building a 15 minute setup with its own power, with its own network, with everything that's self-sufficient. I come into a you know a band or somebody doing a presentation or something like that, set down my gear, do the recording, come uh, tear it all down, and I don't have to worry about their sound guy. I don't have to worry about finding power or anything like that. Uh, and then of course getting you know uh, one or two sets or whatever speeches going on from there. Uh, so what I use my Stream Deck for is in the PTZ cameras is it has the ability to not only lock the focus, autofocus, but also uh, change the uh, the shutter speed, change the iris, and uh, change the white balance on the camera. So with those, I have those buttons set up in companion because the PTZ optics uh, uh, side load, it has those options to do that. And then I have uh, its own button panel. The only problem is I have a 15 button stream deck with the portable machine. So that I really have to be thoughtful on how I set up the buttons because it basically takes up two pages. If I want to have control, if I want to have uh, set spots, and if I want to have the control of the optics inside. Let's go to our next question. Uh, the next question comes from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas, USA. How do we democratize AI and quantum computing so it's not in the hands of the select elite? Go ahead, John. This is a good question and a very tough question. And if you watch the industry and watch some of the leaders being interviewed, so the only bastion left on AI for, for open source is, is stability.ai, which is uh, Imad, the CEO. And he's he's uh, steadfast in, in making sure that he promotes the open source community for AI. Open AI used to be open, and their charter and their mission is to remain open until Microsoft came in on the knocking on the door with $10 billion, and now I call them closed AI. 
um, but to build these giant models um are is millions and millions of dollars and to run the compute the platforms if you know how much these nvidia cards cost that these things are running on that's the reason why open ai raised this money they couldn't raise the money as a nonprofit, and so they have this for-profit organization that they raised the money for and that they've limited the amount of return that these companies that invested can get back it's really really intriguing but you're going to have the you're going to have closed you're going to have closed systems, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Salesforce, Oracle, IBM, all the only ones going to be able to afford these giant systems for the large language models and the imaging generate the generative a AIs uh, until the hardware gets more and more powerful. And so it's going to be a battle between the open source community and the closed source community right now. Closed source is, is winning just because it's so expensive uh, to power these models. So it, it's something to watch. Go ahead, Dave. You know, Paul, you're old enough to know about the California gold rush and how people gave up farming or left the big city to go win their fortune on the panning of rivers and the destruction of the nature out in California. And we had a similar thing up here in Canada where people came up here into the far north and some froze to death trying to get their fortune. So I think we're in a gold rush uh, with respect to AI. Everybody is not quite sure where the value is, but they just want to get their shovel in the dirt and stake their claim and mark the territory they can in the time that they can using whatever leverage they can find. So yes, uh, as John says, when you're nonprofit and developing these things, everybody looks in your window and says, how you doing, how you doing? And then as soon as you release something amazing, life-changing, or as I dare I say, paradigm shifting, that there's a whole new way things are gonna be done then people want to jump in with their picks and shovels, show up a lot of money. I can tell you that what we've learned from gold rushes is the place to put your money is in the guy who sells the shovels and the boots because everybody arrives unprepared for this stuff. And the people who come up with ideas of how to deploy AI, how to put it into use or make it fit your everyday life are the ones who are going to make most of the money. But the big platforms, yeah, they're going to jump in first because they got the bigger shovels. Okay, Courtney. Yeah, it depends on the depth of your pockets, I guess. There is, I did find the first portable quantum computer available for uh, under $9,000. You can get it from Castor here. I think it's only two or three qubits, though, so you're not going to do a whole lot of high-speed computing on that uh, or anything practical. But, you know, if you want to get your feet wet on the ground floor of quantum computing, you know, there you go. Nine grand gets you in the door. Fantastic. Let's go to this. I don't know how well this is going to age uh, as, we, as we turn back to this. Let's go to our next question. While we're heavily into the AI section now, this is the section of the show where we discuss AI. Uh, Alex Lindsay brings a question from Novato. How do you think AI will impact design over the next decade? Nigel. So I think there's a couple of things. I think it'll affect both designs and designers. So for those of us who have websites or substacks or something, when we want to use a graphic, either we borrowed one from somewhere on the internet, uh, sourcing it so they would take pity on us, or we paid a designer to do it. I don't do any of that stuff anymore. I go to you know mid-journey and throw something at it and he gives me a graphic. Mostly that looks really great. Now, is it as good as something a real designer would have done? The answer is no. Is it spot on? No. But the amount of time I'm willing to spend on it compared to the amount of impact I think it's going to have as part of a, a longer piece will decide how long I spend on it. So in terms of me using graphics, I found that now an extremely useful way. The same way that the uh, the Alex has mentioned in the question, I think always uses Midjourney now for MacBreak Weekly for those images that go on my YouTube feed. Um, so I think that's how it will affect many of issues. It will it affect designers? In the end of the day, I think think about AI, whether it's ChatGPT or whether it's Midjourney. I think the cream will rise to the top, and I think the people who are creative and can do original things will do very well by differentiating themselves with original thoughts and original images. Those who are just blah will get taken away. Go ahead, Dave. 
Well, I, I'm really looking forward to the development of Imagineers and people who are um, clever at making these things perform because that's going to be the skill set that, that moves it. And I think I'm looking myself to the impact of media as itself, that, that the media that adopt AI, the, the uh, outputs that come from AI, are going to change the way we think about a lot of things. And I'm curious... At first, of course, everybody hates it, and then they'll adopt it later, like we remember with microwave ovens. And how it's applied later, I think, is for me the most curious part. In terms of design, yeah, it's going to affect that first because it's a visual and uh, textual uh, medium, but it will start to have its own space, uh, just as you know, the, any new media has the old media as its content. We, we make movies about books or... Uh, television that imitates radio. And we're going to fill it with all of our previous ideas until we start to have brand new ideas, which are inspired by your experiments in AI. So I'm looking forward to seeing some of that. But I'm also going to look at the social change that happens because right now, suspicion about the authenticity of everything, including me, uh, is going to be rampant. And AI uh, seems to be the, you know, the big bear in the woods haunting all of us. But in fact, we might domesticate the thing eventually and we'll lose our fear of being able to, or not being able to distinguish between what's actual and what's uh, fabricated. Yeah, Jeffrey. Yeah, because that's what's actually happening right now. There's a, you cannot, one of the reasons why you can't take an image and say, make this image of me behind the Eiffel Tower uh, without it looking slightly different of you is because A, they're, they're taking the image and then turning it into keywords and then reproducing it. And the biggest reason why that is, is because of security. They're worried about deep fakes. They're worried about, uh, I guess, AI Photoshopping, uh, uh, for lack of a better term. And this is definitely going to be a new way for people to try and fake out people as to where they are or what a celebrity is doing or or any or what news is happening out there. Uh, so I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of AI forensics that's going to be growing up that really quickly that will uh, be able to try and determine where this is coming from because you can buy your own AI server if you have the money and start to develop your own AI images. And if you tell it, if I put in a picture of Tom Cruise, I want a picture of Tom Cruise, it's going to do it. So we're going to see a lot of that in the next 10 years and a lot of security protocols that are going to be coming into place because of it. And Courtney? And I think production designers for like horror movies, you know, if you look at mid-journey samples, you know, it comes up with some really creepy stuff. Uh, that uh, you wouldn't ever think to put together like this. Uh, so it, it's a good starting point for a production illustrator to come up with, a, you know, I want a new design for the the horror, uh, you know, monster in my next monster movie. You know, you can come up with a million different designs and it can give you a photorealistic -re rendering of that so that you know what it, it could look like if, if you created a mask or a, a three-dimensional object, a CGI object that looked like that. It's a good starting point for production illustrator. And John? Next decade. Wow. I think by the next decade, the next 10 years, we'll have we'll have artificial general intelligence. And after that, it's game over. So they'll be doing everything all the generative stuff will be all video so it will be text to video or voice to video and you'll be able to create uh, you know ai by then will will win oscars will win emmys will win every award that's out there so it it's uh, it's a monumental shift in society all right well thank you our producers for our first hour but don't go anywhere we're going to shift right into our education hour we'd like to to encourage you to look at the lineup for next week our uh, next week's schedule is out and if you'll notice there's a lot of topics that are, are uh, associated with our different verticals looking at nab and what's uh, coming out from there also monday is going to have a fascinating discussion with rob garrett uh, talking about training, something that he has expertise on. And I see on Friday, there's a hint of a special discussion. So we'll have to see what that's about. But without further ado, we'll switch right to our second uh, part of our show with our, our second hour uh, discussion on education. 
Dave, what do we have for today? Thanks, Josh. This past March was Autism Acceptance Month. I'll bet none of you knew that. Today, I'm sharing the show with someone who's been a regular panelist on Education Hour, Hersheed Trivedi. He's agreed to help me with our discussion by providing some history in the development of tech to assist people and help me integrate those innovations into everyday life. I've been on the edges of helping people get an education, uh, which has exposed me to the many special support systems people need to overcome sight and hearing barriers and physical barriers. I've had to change my vocabulary many times to incorporate new definitions of what people are challenged by. Just this week, I heard the phrase vision loss spectrum, which better defines the variation in capacity for sight, which I've long ago learned is not always total blindness. Only recently has the cognitive impairment realm been explored, and these areas are now seeing expansion into assistive tech for mental health and other areas of human development. Although we usually have an education and schooling context, today we hope to expand our discussion to encompass both ordinary life, workplace, or entertainment context with regard to assistive technologies for all purposes. So we start a little bit with the groups who've worked to provide supports have established a group of tenets around this issue. And they are, one, everyone has the right to participate. And two, access to information is a right, not a privilege. So today, our discussion is about innovations of the best kind. Rashid, why don't we start with some significant people who paved the way? You're uh, not coming through, so I'm going to get you to switch your mic there. You are unmuted. Well, you were unmuted, but your system seems to be, um, you're off your mic, I guess, is what I'm saying. No, we're still very low there. Oh, now we don't have you at all. Earlier, you were testing some audio. Uh, have you returned that to normal? Yeah, I think I heard you originally, Harshi, but then you were really low. Yeah. So maybe just uh, just needed to use that first setup and turn it up a little bit. It's almost as if there's a pad in it or a mute. Mm -hmm. Well, I could go on uh, and talk about how on the Discord uh, we have a list of links, which if anyone's interested under the education channel in Discord for office hours, uh, there are a pile of links with, which we were going to refer to, some with the organizations that support and have developed policy around assistive tech and uh, supports for people in general public, as well as some software, uh, some hardware and some software, which are assistive technologies that we thought were rather interesting. Um, while Harshid is figuring out his audio, what I could do is, uh, if I'm allowed to share my screen, I could share a discovery that I just had in the last week or so. And it was... how uh, Apple's uh, always had accessibility features. And uh, the accessibility feature that I've never used was to increase the contrast. And I had uh, a sheet, and I'll try and zoom in on this. Yeah, there we go. This is the menu for pages. And on the right-hand side is what I was normally using. And there are various shades of gray for the buttons and the menus and the, the boxes for putting in information and selecting dropdowns. 
And uh, my sight is not as sharp as it used to be, and I'm old, so I'm not surprised that I have to have thicker glasses every time I go. Well, recently I was exploring uh, accessibility, and it allowed me to, uh, it's describing it as increased contrast. But what it did is it put lines around all the um, areas that I would interact with. And I found that incredibly helpful. And it's a simple thing, but it assists me even better. And this applies to any app that I launch, is I now have what almost resembles an OS 9 uh, interface uh, with lines around things and uh, more obvious contrast between the things that I'm looking at. I tested it with the color uh, wheels and all that, and those are all the same, but it's just the interface elements, the icons and things that are part of the operating system and the finder interface that allow people to see the edges and be able to identify things a little more clearly. So I was using it just this week and I'm finding I'm much more comfortable and not having to hunt or, or wonder if that tab was the one I, I clicked. So I just, in terms of assistiveness, this has helped me as a person who uses, you know, pages and numbers and all the rest. Uh, even in Zoom, uh, my menus now are more clear to me. And it's not that I'm not misclicking things anymore, but it, it is making me more comfortable using this stuff as I find the screens and me don't get along just as much. Uh, so uh, assistive technologies are, are uh, coming at us and they're available to us. And even as we're trying to explain here, every benefit that's coming to the uh, less uh, capable communities and those even with uh, critical deficits uh, can actually help everyone in their ordinary life. And I can confess one thing that happened just as we were developing this show, Hershid and uh, a partner he works with uh, named Sandy, uh, we're talking to me uh, on a Zoom call to work up our show and uh, taught me that uh, making PDFs with Acrobat Pro, there's a feature in there which I've never seen before and never used. And I've always prided myself in being mostly aware and keenly aware actually of, about HTML and making it uh, compliant with uh, assistive needs, uh, readers and uh, navigating and alt tags and the usual descriptive uh, supports that go into HTML. I wasn't aware that PDFs have the same features and the tags and uh, reader orientation and proper titling and, and headers and footers uh, are, are examined by uh, Acubet, uh, Acrobat Pro. They taught me that if I dig down a little deeper into the menus, I find an accessibility test that you can run on whatever document you're making, and it'll give you a list of things to correct if you want it to work in a reader, uh, a speak reader for uh, the sight impaired, and also for hearing in, uh, impaired, you can uh, have the reader read more clearly if you mark these things properly and it won't run sentences together or miss periods and that sort of stuff. It was enlightening to me to be taught by uh, uh, people needing assistance that I need assistance too sometimes and making this more compliant uh, was a real revelation for me. And so as I've scheduled uh, in a few weeks time, I'm going to be scheduling a whole thing on PDFs for the education hour. Uh, look forward to that. I'll just pitch that a little bit. Uh, I thought I was a master of uh, PDFs until they showed me there's a feature in there I have never used. So we can learn something uh, from people in the community as well. Have we got Hershid? No, we don't. Okay, well, what I'll do is take uh, part of what Hershid was going to talk about and do it for him. And that way we're not uh, running on. Uh, we do have one question we could go to. But before we do that, I wanted to mention that the uh, uh, Justice Department in 1990 uh, passed a, a Accessibility Act. Um, I don't actually have the name for the ADA. But in 91, George H.W. Bush uh, passed the ADA regulations for, uh, for doing things on the web. Uh, but they also made it a, an arm of the Justice Department, not a separate uh, um, government department. It's a subset of justice. And it was uh, put in so that accessibility would have a focus from then on in almost every government activity. Well, they came up with a thing called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which have been around for a little while now. And they also have that 
you can be fined for not having an accessible web page. So the WCAG, or WCAG, as Hershey likes to call it, um, focused more heavily on the four principles of accessibility. And uh, this extends far beyond just web design. Uh, these accessibility principles actually appeal to me in terms of reminding ourselves about what we can and can't do, or what we can and can't see, or what we can't hear. And just as uh, we've been having discussions in office hours, for, for instance, about Apple's transparency feature on their earbuds and how uh, the um, Bose ear, um, in-ear monitors uh, actually now have transparency. And just a couple of weeks ago, we had an audio session on a Wednesday where uh, we had people talking about the in-ear monitors and how the new technologies applied there uh, are helping the hearing impaired people to hear better and to distinguish between uh, you know, your dog barking and the one on TV barking. So these things are coming at us and uh, we're getting better lives, uh, better control over our hearing and our sight and giving us enhancements that are uh, making it possible for us to um, work with technologies that, that make things better for even ordinary people. I know my mother who was uh, mostly deaf uh, would have benefited from having uh, AirPods that would be able to have transparency where she could hear what was in the room as well as what was uh, coming at her on her music or her radio. And uh, this would have been a feature for her so that she would not not hear someone uh, leaving or entering the room. Uh, the four principles that I referenced here are perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And the acronym is P-O-U-R, which is POUR. Um, Hershey wanted me to have a sound effect at this point of pouring water or something and make that point. I didn't do that, but that's okay. Perceivable is part of that perception. Uh, we now have described content channels that, that allow you to uh, blind people to watch television and to be able to know what's going on because it's described. Uh, there's been a YouTube clip that Hershey has put on Discord in the um, uh, disability, um, the assistive uh, technology section, in which a, a congressperson uh, describes herself as she begins a, a speech and how she tells the audience uh, what she looks like, uh, how old she is, and where she is, and what the scene is, and then proceeds to give her message. And this is probably a practice that's going to get uh, more and more uh, uh, apparent to us that we'll start having. Uh, just as in Canada here, we have the uh, acknowledgement of the uh, native lands that we are occupying. And uh, this is a speech announcement that's a, a regular practice at regular meetings and all gatherings is this, this acknowledgement. Well, as well, we're going to start having people who say, I'm a fairly bald guy who's in his 60s and I wear glasses and I'm in a room with a lot of uh, cubby holes and paneling. Uh, my, I'm wearing a white striped shirt and I'm addressing you on a microphone. So I'm giving some person a visual reference and a context in which to understand what they're, what other people are seeing and what they can share. You know, what's interesting about that, Dave, is um, people have their representations visually, the little emojis, you know, or mm -hmm. memojis or things. And well, sometimes they'll have these, yeah. these little, yeah, boutique things of, describing themselves and it, it it sounds like that last description was a bit of an ad hoc description of yourself mm. but what if you had some time to really think about that and you know finalize that and curate that that audio description for yourself you know? <laughs> uh, if i gave it time <laughs> what what do they say I, I didn't have time to write a short thing so i wrote a book or something like that but yeah if i really focused on it i'd probably have a little thing up here in a sticky which is my my generic description of myself you know well, you can expect uh, well, we, it too to be cartoonized a little bit, you know, because that's a little, a little embellished, you know, our, our uh, emojis are a little embellished about our, our appearance. That's right. I'm, I'm uh, somewhat unshaven today and uh, I have big ears and, you know, all of the details they need to sort of, you know, if they had to handle my face to find out what I look like, then we'll give them the description. Yeah. Uh, the second part was operational, uh, the O in poor. Uh, it's where alternative aids to communication or physical supports, uh, and this is applicable to all. We're all benefiting from the dips in the sidewalks that allow people with strollers to be able to go up and down the sidewalks, and it's not just for wheelchairs. 
um, tablet interfaces and touch technologies are enhancing all kinds of operational facets. And, and it's actually helped the autistic community to discover that young people with autism can relate better to a touchscreen than they can a keyboard. And they're enjoying learning through tablets than they are trying to operate um, even just pencils and pens. We have Hershey back, so I'm going to give him a chance to yes, test his audio. You know, I oh, also good. have alternative keyboard too that wasn't playing playing, playing nice with. And me that's today. where we are. We're but, at operational. Yeah, I, I, so I, I, you, you take over here. Yes. So here we are. I have my Logitech keyboard. But then again, why do I have one when my laptop has a keyboard? Right. So we want to make sure that we're always connecting uh, what we make as a product. So if we make a website, we make an app or we're making a stream because we want someone to come to our product, we want to make sure that they could interact with it. So if you're trying to write comments and such, you might need a, a, a alternative keyboard because you can't type properly because you might have other disabilities. And it is also important to re recall that with operable, it's kind of like to think externally or outside the realm of uh, what tech might be or what you might think of tech as. And uh, we'll move on to what the next section will be, which is understandability. Yeah. And with the understandability part, there is a, a lot of interesting focus because we might not think that, you know, we have that ability or disability or that issue, but cognition of how we introduce information on a web page, for example, or on any um, matter for that fact, right? Like if you have a website and you know that you have the home button, the contact us button, the about us button, it paints a picture for a end user to say, hey, if I want to get the person's contact information, I know to go to contact us and more than likely I'll find some email or phone number in that context. Um, other components might be to deal with the way colors might look on a web page or the way the layout is. If we're making a web page that's so busy or if we're making content content that's so busy no one's going to have time for you to you know go through listening or why do you have so many sound effects in your video stream or what have you and we always want to remember that we're talking about the classroom here in our hour for today but uh, what we were talking about earlier before my audio uh, wigged out on me sorry about that is uh, how certain people have been big influencers right so the ada was a big influence and thus that uh, some of these practical ideas like the word poor right now we're on understandability which is part of the you and poor um mm -hmm. it really ties in together that somebody you know had to go through the hardships that we might have not gone through and therefore you know how do we take ai and how do we teach it properly right so it's the same concepts we're all going to kind of learn through and how do we understand that information of what ai might be or any of this we've talked about some interesting topics today and uh, so dave how about uh, with robust what do you think could you define that for people with the R before we get to robust yeah i wanted to focus mm -hmm. on cognition and clarity uh, that jargon free uh, more expository explanations in the text of any kind of uh, interface that we're working with, including off, you know, um, uh, operating systems that we encounter. Uh, yeah, everything from the ATM on up has sort of jargon in it as to what the makers of it are familiar with certain words, and we're not if we're just the people using the front end. We also, I wanted to bring up that you know, Office Hours has, has been deep into this with cognition and clarity. Uh, we talk a lot about, you know, the, um, I guess, the myth of Zoom fatigue, because clarity is the issue. If you're getting clarity and people are able to be understood, then there's no extra cognitive load. And we make it much simpler and much easier to do things. Um, I think uh, unnecessary clutter is uh, clogging up most of our public feeds and all our news, uh, things we're trying to access information and we're getting a lot of clutter. Uh, we often have YouTube videos that have too much at the front and we never get to the point, this sort of thing. And this is an impairment for everybody, not just an impairment for people who have uh, reading difficulties or, or hearing difficulties. So yes, let's go to robustness. Sure. So uh, I, I was talking to Dave here uh, the other day and I was like, hey, Dave, you ever walk through the mall or, you know, a store and you have like the sliding glass doors or the revolving doors? 
isn't that a robust idea? Because to me, it sounds like it's for anybody, right? If I have vision impairments, I could hit the button and the door's going to open up for me and just walk right through. I don't have to touch the handle. And that's the idea that kind of what robust means here. And how is something that you might make in your classroom going to be robust for everybody to obtain? Are we going to make a you know, Google slide document that can be reachable on a Mac computer or on a Windows computer. So, you know, sometimes we do have to make those choices of how do we make our information robust as possible for every individual. Uh, we might not look at, like, for example, dyslexia as uh, how the font scaling or font face might in, in, inter, you know, interact with the way information is portrayed to you. And to just make sure that everybody has a awesome website to go to where everything you know fulfills kind of that poor outline i think that we add more robustness to our all every living and you know every part of our lives we don't have to just necessarily think in well this is accessibility this doesn't have to do with me uh, my eyes are good i could hear good i could smell good or you know any of that we want to make sure that we're kind of just seeing how can we help each other and then make those standardizations, right? And how do we change those items to be more robust and be available to more people? Because we can't just make a vertical and say, well, if you don't hit this vertical, you're not going to be you know, robust because then that's just picking one over the other. We want to build growth. So we want to build a horizontal uh, procedure to this that we build more than one layer of accessibility mm -hmm. to that robust idea. Mm -hmm. And Dave, you have any thoughts on this? Well, you know, I had one last thought before we go to questions, uh, that if um, in the next 10 years, perhaps, um, assisted driving is so good that a blind person could drive. That would be fun. All right, let's try a few of these questions. We have four on deck here. Let's start with the first one. All right. The first question comes from Bob Sturdivant from San Antonio, and he wants to know if the community has been able to take advantage of any of the different AI tools to help accessibility, and if so, which ones? That's really interesting because I just learned about some of these today, but I'm going to let um, Harshid describe sure, one I or two on that he has been able to uh, demonstrate for me. I uh, haven't we're not been, at the halftime demo yet, but if you're not at the halftime demo the, yet. The, uh, yeah. I haven't necessarily used specific tools in this uh, section, but um, a lot of these tools are on their waiting list, right? So we mentioned Microsoft earlier in the show with how uh, open AI and now it's kind of the closed AI. Well, ChatGPT is, the, is sort of a Microsoft product and Be My Eyes, for example, is leveraging that where they've added a virtual assistant. So let's say you, uh, you're you into car magazines. You flip to a page, you point your camera at it, you, use, you ask the virtual assistant through your microphone, hey, what's the picture on the right-hand page? And it says it's a black Lamborghini Diablo with a hue of green at the back. Oh, okay. Like So you're getting an idea of what might be on a piece of pa paper through a sort of virtual uh, assistant and if it might be people it might do an alt tag of description so i kind of find it funny to see most of the people on the panel when they get as, uh, excited about the describe feature on uh, mid journey because to me it helps i think everybody else so uh it's just quite funny that some of these uh, tools that we're using they, they kind of equal out to uh, what everybody else is using Yeah, we have a lot of these links in our Discord channel. Um, the uh, one or two there are assistive technologies for people who have trouble communicating. Uh, that is that they don't speak, uh, sort of like uh, Stephen Hawking style where you push a set of icons and they help assemble a sentence. So we've got some of that in there and we've got the Be My Eyes uh, service and also two or three, well, two other services. Uh, which uh, have live helpers, which you can sign up for. And when a person needs help doing something like their taxes, uh, they can actually have a helper walk them through it and be on the same website and explain and, and guide them. And, and it, it's much more interesting that way than to try and do it through the technology itself. Uh, situationally, uh, there's a context there for each of these AI applications. So, if uh, if we get real good with 
text to speech and speech to text. Uh, we might have a natural language translator, and that would help people who have dyslexia. That might help people who have low vision. It would have a lot of other applications as well. But as an assistive technology, AI is going to, and machine learning, I, I like to more refer to, uh, is going to make smarter machines that know who we are and what our limits are, and then be able to accommodate them with special features that apply to us. Next question. Oh, I had something to add there, Bob. Uh, Dave. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed you. Um, Go ahead, John. I would think that the upcoming um, Apple VR goggles would be super helpful because it's going to have like 15 cameras in it. And it will be able to describe the room that you're walking around or down the street. I got to believe that would be super helpful. Yes, that would be. Because it's going to be like a bone conducting uh, um assistant and uh, someone right now the watch i think taps you uh if you're learning to navigate it taps you to turn left or right and warns you that your destination's coming up and this is all done so that you don't have to stare at a phone while walking through a foreign city and i think the glasses are going to be very interesting and all of them i mean even oculus and the rest are going to be very helpful in giving people uh avenues to perceive that compensate for their deficit yes all right, moving to our next question, Andy Kokendorfer from Vieira, Florida, writes in, can you suggest a guide for acoustics to enhance accessibility? Do you want to field that there, uh, Hershey? For, I'm trying to understand the question a little bit better for acoustics. Um, what I could reference back to is maybe even listening to the uh, How Do We Preserve Our, 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 our Hearing uh, episode. Uh, where we talked about how hearing aids have different ambient mics and stuff like that. So, like, you could use alternative tools to maybe check how loud your surroundings might be rather than forcing it, you know, really, really loud. And that might give you some insight. I know I've taken away some insights from that episode myself, so I don't know if that would help you there. Yeah, I think um, there were some really interesting suggestions there about improving your audio environment, your acoustic space. Uh, primarily, of course, for using, you know, media uh, in that space, but also for personal comfort. Uh, in my own home, um, we're pretty quiet here. We don't have a lot of noisy things, and we try to keep the place fairly calm. Uh, and, I, and I often, because I'm an audio guy, I often will situate things in a room or decide on a fabric or even have a, a size of curtain or even a hanging on the wall uh, will have an impact on the acoustic environment. And also, um, I think I even chose my uh, silverware based on how loud they were when they came and left a drawer. So uh, I think there are things you can do just in your own, you know, uh, what I would say is tuning your perceptions to your environment. I used to teach people who were learning audio and using microphones that if they just uh, went into a room and wanted to know what the room would sound like, they only need to close one ear. They just plug one ear with their finger. And then you'll suddenly hear all the noise in the room because your brain is tuning it out. And for a suggestion for a guide to enhance accessibility in an acoustic environment, that's really important to people who are cognitively deficit and uh, need a, a quiet environment and are disturbed by noise or have uh, annoying noises that distract them that other people don't seem to be able to focus on or can't hear or don't notice. And that is, that's a thing. I don't think there's a formal guide because it's all in the context of the person's needs. All of these things are connected to what a person needs to help them uh, be effective in their environment or with other people. So I think if we looked at the context of a particular acoustic environment, yes, there would be a a need for a focus on how it can help the people who live there. And particularly, of course, when people are choosing a, uh, a living space and they, they're accommodating a disability, they often look at how wide the doors are in an elevator or how long the hallways are, or where the steps are to the garbage and that sort of thing. And, the, and these impairments are pretty obvious visually to those who are physically disabled or need uh, mobile vehicles. But we don't really stop and think about the acoustic environment. So, yeah, that's a good point to be bringing up. Next question. Next question comes from Peter Bach from San Francisco. 
He recommends a great resource is Designing for Accessibility, a business guide to countering low speech intelligibility from the Center for Hearing and Communication. Are there any other resources that you recommend? I personally, no, I don't have any of those resources. Maybe Harshid has one or two in his uh, bucket. Uh, unfortunately, on the hearing impaired side, I don't have as many, but I do know that we have like deaf blind uh, um, uh, people in, in our community. So uh, American Foundation for the Blind, American Council for the Blind, and National Federation for the Blind are probably decent choices to at least uh, find more uh, information and perhaps, you know, if you have a hearing deficiency and maybe not as much with the site, but they still might have alternatives or information that might be able to gear you towards this uh, goal that you have. Yeah, and I saw a few organizations listed for the deaf as well. There are ones in the UK and in Canada and uh, in America. Um, the deaf community are well represented uh, policy-wise, most most jurisdictions, and the school systems are are augmenting deaf. Um, and and uh, Dave, just to mention, uh, yeah. you mentioned the one from UK. That's RNIB, the Royal National Institute for the Blind, and that is the interface for UK. Um, as I mentioned, the other ones being in America, and then CNIB is Canadian National Institute for the Blind. So again, right. uh, everybody kind of works together to you know help the the end goal. So these uh, different resources might be helpful and they're also going to be available on Discord. Yeah, and there are institutes for the deaf. And in my city, we have a school for the deaf, so we're, we're quite aware of that. Uh, next question. And our next question comes from Mandy Van Clee from Monroe, Ohio. For closed captions to be available to participants in Zoom, the meeting host would have to enable them for the meeting. This is often overlooked. Why not have closed captions enabled by, by default in Zoom meetings? I would begin by starting with how big your meeting is. Uh, if your meeting is just four people and you know they don't need it, it would not need to be default and you would have to switch it off. But then we switch off other things when we start a Zoom meeting too. So maybe it should be part of our routine for starting a Zoom meeting. If you're going to have 71 people, which I did just the other night, um, one person had closed caption and so closed captions, uh, needed closed caption, sorry, and we had turned them on for that meeting. So. I think it's maybe a request. Uh, it's something that people should be f familiar with that they can turn on and that they can work with and that they will uh, make an effort to accommodate with. Josh? Yeah, I, I hear your um, uh, observation there, Mandy. And it is true that um, you have to go into the settings and turn on it's under advanced to turn on closed captions. I would say why this is not a, a default for Zoom. Um, we had a, an issue whenever, well, we, I will say, we had an issue with a community that likes to use original sound. Zoom recently changed their settings to that being a um, not by default action. So we have to very deliberately turn on uh, the original sound. And the reason uh, that was given was that they're looking from a support perspective of their platform, how many support tickets are due to people accidentally enabling uh, original sound and having a different experience than they expected. Um, one of the things about video conferencing is that you, unlike being face to face, you don't know how you're coming across your video, your audio, or what's coming on the screen by default. So um, Zoom will likely um, add the default settings to something that will give them less uh, troubleshooting um, uh, calls or trouble tickets for them to to invest in. Um, now, if there's a larger community, they're, they're clamoring for this to be a default feature. That's something I'm sure that they would be res were responsive for. Um, you can do that. You can add this setting on in your own meetings. I guess the, the problem that you're specifically referring to is when you're visiting someone else's meeting, they're not likely to have that setting on as default. So that might be uh, a bit of a hassle. One way that you might uh, address that is to let people know, uh, just to, it, let them acknowledge that um, when attending a meeting to be able to enable those things ahead of time uh, so that, um, you know, that, that can accommodate people that uh, require those captions. 
Um, I will say that the, recently I was um, arranging for the translation, which is generated off of the uh, the auto captioning, and some of the features that Zoom is using for those features. So when um, someone's preparing a meeting and they're looking to um, accommodate people of translation of many different languages, um, that is very promising because of the use of the auto-generated captions in Zoom. They're able to then use engines to then translate that. And then users that come in can go in and select their particular languages. And we found their accuracy to be very, very good, um, above 90, even 95% for the English. And then the translations, in some of them are good. Um, some of the beta translations, though, um, do have some, some issues, but still can allow people to understand what's going on. Well, this time we're going to pause the questions and get back into a couple of things. And um, um, in a minute, Hersheed's going to have a demo. So I'll let him prep for that while I talk about how this might apply to film and TV and other media formats. Because right now, of course, as we've just talked about closed captioning, we also have described content. Uh, we have a service here in Canada, which has a whole... Um, providing for all the networks uh, describe content channel so that you can choose to include that in what you're what you're choosing to watch. Um, sign language interpretation has been added to almost everything. Every major event happening, uh, every big announcement by a government, uh, any kind. Of, I mean, we get it with our hockey teams where there's a um, sign language interpreter right in a press conference. So we have that, uh, which is normalized for our work and our world. Uh, we have working dogs. Working dogs uh, help blind people uh, navigate the world and, and help them get around and, and be productive. Uh, we've had working dogs for decades and decades, and uh, it's almost nearly a century since, since I started training them. And we have them on airplanes, and we accommodate them on rapid transit and that sort of thing. So uh, these things are starting to be normalized. And one of the things Rashid and I were talking about recently was faster playback. That is that uh, a lot of people love to be on YouTube and run things at one and a half speed or maybe double speed to be more efficient in their listening and being able to find uh, information more quickly from people who are doing it in a linear fashion in video. Use paper print swipe with two fingers to unlock. 11, 13, well, uh, T-Mobile. Rashid has assistive tech, like which he uses all the time, like that. <laughs> which is a reader. And uh, nice. he has a, a, a tool in it where he can point uh, that reader at a document and it will... OCR the document, auto, um, um, oh, button, Google search. optical character that. recognition of the document, and then it will speak those words as it understands them. At uh, what speed you, is that, Hershey? Well, he, it's variable because he can set it for slower or faster depending on how close he wants to concentrate. What's it set for right now? 338%. So. Search, double tap and drag to move. Button, Google search. Google oh, search. I thought it was 337. Spotify. Speed rate 372 percent. Now it's at 372. <laughs> YT music. Spotify. He's teasing you. YT music. Magnify. Um, Speed rate 409. Keep notes. Magnify. These assisting texts enrich more modes of perception, uh, which are different from the standard experience, and screen readers are part of that. Uh, we're looking for the Apple Watch and, and yes, the glasses to be more helpful wearables and help with environmental cues and navigation. So I'm going to hand it over to Hershid, who I think is going to talk about popcorn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Popcorn for sure, right? Because uh, every time we come on office hours, we're always talking about how, well, how do you make the best popcorn? So there's this book I got here. If anybody wants this book, please go to dvestore.com and then in the search bar, type in G-A-J-J-A-R for Gajar. This is Damienti Gajar's book, uh, Conscious Cuisine, that I'm holding in my hand. And you'll get a discount if you go to dvestore.com, just letting you know. And I'm going to flip to a page that I flipped to the other day while I was talking to Dave and a piece of paper so go back to it and i'm using an app here it's called envision ai and they have a wearable which they are using google glass as the uh, hardware platform and you so you have chat gpt that's coming onto there as a wearable coming soon you have uh, the envision ai app as what it does for ocr and scene recognition and other things like that and th there are other uh, comparable apps. Envision is just kind of on all the platforms, so that's why I'm kind of mentioning them more since they are uh, offered on uh, Android and iOS, whereas Google Lookout is only found on the uh, Android side, whereas uh, Seeing AI, S-E-E-I-N-G-A-I, -E -E is found only on the um, 
it iOS side, and it's made for uh, it's made by Microsoft. So I'm gonna open up Envision AI real quick. Envision AI button magnifier. There, Advocator. there's my phone screen just to kind of give you a, a, a grab if you want. But just I'm gonna uh, hold use... that under your chin a little more because we're not okay, seeing. Okay, sure. It. Just to get you guys a screen grab to see what the screen's and showing. Tilt it down. Tilting it down. Tab settings. Five of five. Well, in list. Five go. items. I, I'm going to just show you what yeah. I would do with it. Scan tab. Instead. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to go to scan. Tab. Read. Selected. One of five. In document. Library. That Out is what list. I'm looking for. So scan document. Library. Scan text. Capture a document in a single or batch scan. That's what I want. Singles button. Reading in English. English. Choose the language that you want to read. Okay. I got the book no open. Visible. So I'm going to. No edges visible. Try to hold the book, book Move open. Move phone up. Move phone left. Move phone right. Move phone right. Move phone up. Move phone left. Move phone left. Move away from the document. Move phone left. All it is visible. Hold steady. Move phone right. All it is visible. Hold steady. Button. Navigate up. Scan document. Button. Reader preferences. Scan document. Button. Navigate up. Showing item one of one. One IO heavy meat when it is almost done. Milk solid okay, begins so. to collect it. One IO. One IO heavy medium saucepan. Warm butter on medium heat until it melts. One IO heavy medium saucepan. Warm butter on medium heat until it melts. Continue to cook on medium low heat for about 15 minutes. Butter will bubble and make bubbling sounds. When it is almost done, milk solids will begin to collect at the bottom of the saucepan. Do not stir the butter as it may burn you. There will be some white scum floating on top. Fry to level so up this scum it layer. At a when it is done, it will look clear and become very follow. quiet. Toke it off the heat as it tends to Give burn. Give it to very us as you would hear it, Hershey. So we 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 heard a couple took and take and sorry about the post ups. We heard a couple. Um, issues there but for what it's worth it's not that bad and then when you add something like a chat gpt or any assistant to that and some of this ai we we have a lot of leverage to work with and i think with apps such as envision ai having the glasses it's going to be you know a helper and when i think the, the other part is is if we all trying to make things more cheaper. So if we try to invest in these accessibility tools, because they're really, really expensive at this point, and there's only a couple of companies making them. So, you know, if you feel like you want to in invent and you're an inventor, an engineer, I would definitely recommend that you get into this game because there's a lot of money to be made. Okay. One of the things that came up in uh, Hershey's research, and I found it very fascinating, is that uh, a, an organization has given blind people a chance to go to Broadway shows and to be able to not just sit in the seats and listen, but to actually get up on stage and touch everything. Uh, Hershey, do you want to explain uh, what was going on there? Sure, absolutely. So we were going to have a guest on today, but we uh, unfortunately she couldn't make it. Um, her name is Sandhya Rao, and you could find out more about her at ibugtoday.com, I-B-U-G-T-O-D-A. Uh, T-O-D-A-Y dot org or dot com. Either site will take you there. And so she's a vice president of iBug. And she is also in a wheelchair because of her uh, other ailments that she has with her bones. Um, but regardless of that, she's also a, a graduate of Stanford University as a law in law. And she works in Texas in, in some of the, you know, as a basically as a lawyer. And it, Still, this is kind of her passion to make things more accessible or teach people how to use an iPhone or a Mac. Or for me, I teach people how to use Android devices. And so we are always seeking different ways of interacting. And uh, recently I was watching the news and the next episode came on or whatever TV is running and I hear a voice on TV. And so it was a touch tour of Hamilton that was in Houston. And she was able to feel the masks and the costumes and stuff preemptively to the show and be more interactive with the show. Um, I've also listened to a couple of people that are working on um, certifications in that space. Uh, Deborah Lewis is one of the people that is in that space that I heard. And so for what Sandhya has brought to the table is to one, be available to have a, a place for others to come watch movies in audio description every Friday or, you know, to have a interactive uh, interactive situation in a play or a, a TV show or any of that because we all want to have the same fun as everybody else, right? So if you like Shakespeare, Hamilton, this, that, and the other, we would all love to go see it. Or if there's concerts, you know, we would want that 
uh, process to be more accessible when you buy tickets, right? You, you want to make sure your forms are uh, signed, you know, the forms are labeled properly so that I could buy a ticket to, to enjoy the event. So Sandhya has brought a lot of good points to the community as, you know, being the vice president of iBug today. And uh, the other gentleman that I want to bring on board, and he actually worked on the space station, and that's Michael McCulloch. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk about more about him on another episode. Sure. It's interesting when I when I listen to the YouTube video of what they were doing, uh, they mentioned that they have 30 productions who are adopting these special events for the blind. So they're putting them into the schedule that when they travel to various places, they'll have a special day where groups can come in and uh, experience the thing beforehand and then watch the play proceed. Uh, as well, uh, it was pointed out to me that tonal changes of voice, which actors learn to do, uh, convey emotion and context for those who aren't able to see the show. So it is possible, as we know with radio plays and that, that you can enjoy a Broadway show just by sitting and listening. But it really helps to get a sense of what the costumes are like, uh, what some of the props are and where places are on the stage that and, and have some of the scenery described to you so that when you do hear what's going on, you can visualize what's, what's happening. Um, we have John Preda with his hand up, and I'm wondering if it's about popcorn. So let's see. I I have a general question on the screen readers, Arshid. So so if you have a page like a web page that's dynamic and stuff's changing, how do you zero in on where you want it to read? Wonderful question. So there isn't necessarily a dynamic place that you would use your eyes to so you're, you're thinking of your eyes at that point right so if you're thinking of a web page let's just say you have five paragraphs and on the top you have a logo and then you have buttons that say home contact us right left to right and if we're looking at information like that if information is changing below like an advertisement it's not important to you right then and there what is important might be is you want to read the main paragraph or the main the meat of the meat and potatoes of the article or so a news you, or a news ticker or sports right so you uh, want to scoreboard. focus on that item so if let's say if it's a news ticker right i would focus on the news ticker and then a news ticker would be the one that's changing its its dynamicness but how do you do that how do you focus on that area um what you would do with a screen reader typically is swiping or if you're using alternative keyboards you could use a keyboard so if i arrow down to let's say the you have a, a, a detail on your web page, right? You have a HTML code of a ticker, right? And then you have a graphics uh, on your on your web page. So you want to check out the ticker, not the graphics. And so what I would do is then arrow down with, let's say, a keyboard on the computer to that ticker. And then if that ticker is going to give me the baseball scores or what have you, that's going to change, then I could refresh that area or I could keep moving my arrow up and down in that little area and it's going to read me the refreshed number. Got it. So so if it's ESPN or something it'll read me that refreshed number. But if I look at if I look at the web page, I'm not going to hear it if I'm at the top of the web page that these numbers are changing or things are dynamic. That's kind of the uh explore till you know what's going on on your web page. All right. It's um Interesting to me that um, there are things ordinary people can do to help out. And uh, the expertise in office hours answering questions of a technical nature about media and production and events is really helpful. But there's also expertise here that can help in the, uh, the larger uh, community of disabled people. Uh, what can ordinary people do? Well, they can sign up for Be My Eyes or ARIA Explorer and lend your voice to the organization if you have experience in voice work. Um, we can also see how things have changed and start advocating in for uh, the disabled community in our own local areas and uh, see what needs to be done and maybe advocate for having some things done. Uh, Hershita and I some time ago talked about the currencies uh, that countries use and the uh, plastic or paper that these currencies are printed on and how they're slowly beginning to add things to it. And I know in Canada here, we put Braille on our money some dec about 12, 15 years ago, and it's been very helpful for the blind to be able to distinguish the, the denomination of, of paper currency. Uh, but there are issues with uh, coinage and uh, difficulty determining coinage. 
Uh, I've seen some from my recent visit to uh, Japan that uh, all the sidewalks and streets and inside buildings have yellow strips down the middle. And they're there to help people who have uh, white canes uh, to be able to navigate and know where a sidewalk ends or where an alley starts and be able to see that I'm on this side of the yellow line and I'm not going to run into you if you're coming toward me. Uh, I didn't think about that much while I was there. But when I came back, I kind of missed the yellow line because I thought this would be really helpful in my environment. So I might advocate for that. I'd also like to point out that all these things help everyone. And I've been repeating that through the whole show, but I think it needs repeating constantly that I benefit from any kind of improvement as well. So if we get ourselves out of the tech verticals and have more capability on all platforms and in every online service or, or feature or um, social media, uh, then it improves your design and it, it really makes things easier for everybody. Uh, we can integrate these things in our labs and in office hours and uh, maybe in after hours where we take time to describe things or we try and make sure that the visualization of things is not the primary mode of communication. Uh, and, and we're doing similar things, but there are some things we could be doing better. And maybe even during our question and answer periods in the first hour, a little more description of what people are seeing when they put up a, a web page or something to explain a doc, a device, uh, we may need to describe a little more of what we're looking at. And uh, I really think it's interesting that, that Tom, uh, uh, one of our regular panelists, works with hearing aids and uh, also is able to monitor himself. And uh, he has some opinions sometimes on how hearing aids will seal you off from the world and it, and it changes your perception of the world. Um, we have a question uh, from uh, Laura, so let's hear what she's got to ask. Yes, we do. Uh, Laura Thompson from Beaumont, Texas asks, Harshid, are you familiar with the Vision Aware website? I am not aware of that website uh, specifically, but uh, would be happy to uh, go find it in the Accessibility General to go look at it after the show in Discord. All right. Um, I did mention earlier about making PDFs better, and one of the ways that that was brought up to me is that when Hershid and uh, his partner were, were reading my PDF, it would describe a graphic, and I had a bullet. So I wasn't aware that PDF was making a bullet out of using a graphic. And we also noticed on a web page we were looking at, it described a, a, an image by its name.png. So it was like uh, 257IF underscore uh, BAR and then PNG. And that was the verbal description of an icon. And we're not trying hard enough to put in what an image is we're rather we're letting these these images be described uh, almost randomly according to what we where we get them from or what sort of services we're picking them up from. So it's to advocate more for uh, anything we do in office hours to run it through the uh, checks uh, for alignment with the regulations and make sure that we're doing that stuff ourselves. Uh, we do have links on the site for all of the organizations mentioned, the uh, CNIB in Canada, the AFB, the ACB, and the Royal National in uh, the UK. So look up some of those, see, learn something from them, and see where there's opportunities uh, for people to, to uh, be helped with what they do. Um, Arshid uh, wanted me to mention this uh, thing that my wife and I came up with, and it was a um, an, in, an agency that would have retired kindergarten teachers and retired kindergarten teachers would be hired by organizations to do quality assessment of their interfaces, their operations and how easy something is to use because they're in the business of explaining to kindergarten kids how something works. And if they were used uh, more uh, consistently, then maybe we would improve the uh, interfaces for some of these obscure things like trying to fill out an insurance form on an insurance page and not knowing what the nomenclature jargon is and not knowing why when I finish this, it takes me back to the front page and things break and I can't understand why it's not working for me. And as a guy who has been using computers long enough to be able to manage a, a web page interface, 
I figure some of them don't pass the kindergarten teacher test. So maybe in the in a future job, I'll, I'll set up uh, uh, an agency where teachers around the world are helping people uh, make simpler explanations of things for web pages or interfaces. Uh, we should all keep moving forward and continue to innovate and leverage the potential of machine learning when it comes to this stuff. I want to thank Hersheed, and uh, it's been a pleasure to sort of share the stage with you and uh, to be able to answer some of these questions as well. Another thank you goes to all who participated today. We had a very small panel today, but that's all right. Dave, uh, we also acknowledge... Them, yeah. If we want to remind them about May 18th is a GAD, oh, Global yes. Accessibility Awareness Day. So thank we you. will have more discussions on accessibility. Laura, please come on the panel. Uh, we miss you on the panel right now. And uh, again, if we have more questions, please feel free to, you know, ask us in Discord or after hours as well. I'm more than happy to answer anything and uh, show you how it works or how a screen reader might help your business. So please feel free to get in touch. Yeah, that's a global awareness day and it's May 18th. So you might even see that on the news uh, in your regular feeds. Um, there's always people in after hours all day and all night ready to get you a quick answer, well, most of the time, to nearly any technical questions you might have. I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, Josh is showing us the Global Awareness Day uh, page, which uh, is 39 days away. Is that what that is? Yes. There's a countdown on there. It's from the GAAD Foundation, and uh, we encourage everyone to check that out. Uh, thanks for being here. We'll see you again next Saturday for Education Hour. I didn't do the traversal. I'm way out of practice here. Thanks, Josh, for stepping up. Thanks, John, for hanging out with us. Thank you, Harshid, for absolutely. Thank you. Your presentation that was interesting. Harshid, just Midjourney just added a describe scene into Midjourney last week, and it works pretty well. Just like all look, about accessibility. My eyes, or whatever it's called, or look my eyes. Be my eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Does it tell you? what it tried to make it look like or is it telling you the one no you uploaded you, you 